أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam we would like to greet you all by saying السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today Alhamdulillah we are here with our Sheikh Sheikh Wasim Khan and be idhnillah he will be talking about black magic and the solution to it be idhnillah tabaraka wa ta'ala so we can all listen carefully maybe you can have a piece of paper and write down things he will be saying and at the end of the talk there will be you know a chance for those who wants to ask question and also sisters they can write it on a piece of paper we will send there you know someone who will be collecting the questions Wajazakumullah wa khaira. We will just hand over the mic to the Sheikh. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillahi Ladi bi ni'matihi tatimu salihat. Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyil arabiyil mabaruthi lin nasi ajma'in. وعلى آله وصحبه من تبيهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد. It's always a great pleasure to be here in Blackburn. Nice, cozy masjid, providing many, mashallah, facilities and services to the local community. I ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to bestow upon this masjid. the fadl and the, the blessings to allow this masjid to continue blessing the community of Blackburn and the wider community. The topic that's given today and hence all of you are here is black magic in Islam or the reality of black magic in Islam. And in today's talk that's exactly what we're going to be looking at. Sihr, magic in Islam, what is it? Does it actually exist? Do people have issues with jinn? How do they deal with these issues? Are there any historical recollections from the Quran or anything from a hadith to show and support that there is sihr in Islam? We will inshallah look at all this and also look at providing solutions if people have been affected by sihr. But before we begin, it's important for me to share with you a very important disclaimer. Very important. Because sometimes, as a community, we tend to get things uh, mixed up when it comes to issues such as jinn, sihr, or the other issue that I spoke about last year. We had a conference on this issue that was mental health. I say this at the beginning and I will say this at the end. It's important to understand the difference between a clinical depression case or somebody who has mental health issues, psychosis, schizophrenia, depression and sihr. What we normally tend to do is everything and anything is sihr. Not knowing that there is a medical health condition where many people, and that's on the increase, mental health is on the increase. So we have to understand that there is a distinction between the two. Let's not conflate the two. Because we always have two extremes. We have one extreme that doesn't believe in magic at all. Ah, oh, this is hocus pocus, doesn't... We don't think there's any evidence in the Quran, we live in this... amazing 21st century technological era there is no such thing as black magic these were just tales of the old that's one extreme and the other extreme is anything and everything is sihr you have a, a headache oh somebody must have done magic on you. you 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 know you're going through a bad patch in life like everyone does oh this must be uh ayn or this must be you know jinn it's very important to understand that we are in the middle where we do not deny the fact that sihr exists, but we also affirm the fact that there are medical conditions 
that also need to be looked at. You need to go to a medical practitioner and have to be assessed and get everything checked out. If those things show that there is nothing wrong and you are still experiencing something, then maybe we can go towards a spiritual solution. That being said, let's begin the talk and let's begin with some of the skeptics who deny the fact that magic actually exists. There are many people who say that we live in the 21st century. We have some of the most sophisticated technology in the world, x-ray machines, you can put somebody in an x-ray machine and they can show every iota of your body. Every minute detail. You have thermal imaging that can sense and see everything. Which makes people think if there were such things as jinn or magic or these kind of hocus pocus things, we would have really picked them up by now. In today's sophisticated time. And to these people we say that there is a thing such as magic jinns of obviously do exist the world of the jinnat exists that's part of our iman so the beginning of the talk i'm going to present to you some of the historical recollections from the quran about magicians and the world of the jinn we can begin by speaking about the one prophet who was mentioned over a hundred times in the Quran. Does anyone know who that particular prophet is? Put your hands up. Let's ask an interaction. No. One. Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam is mentioned over a hundred times in the Quran. And there's a famous issue that takes place. There's a famous event which involves magic. You see, Musa is sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take Bani Israel away from the tyranny of Fir'aun. And as he goes to Fir'aun, Fir'aun is seeing this man standing in front of him. And the man is presenting himself as a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of Fir'aun's kibar and arrogance, he's saying, what do you mean there is a higher being? I don't believe in anything. And then Musa alayhi salam, he throws down his stick that was one of the miracles that Allah had bestowed upon him as well as his hand. When he would take out his hand, his hand was white. So when he threw down the stick, the stick became a snake. What did Fir'aun say? Was he taken aback and what is this? No. Fir'aun said that this is magic. This is standard. This is the run of the mill stuff that we have. In our kingdom he wasn't taken aback by this so then he set up this challenge as allah mentions in the quran he said bring me all the best magicians let's deal with this guy called musa he thinks he has some special magic let it let us show him what magic actually is he's trying to uh mess around in my kingdom Let's just show this guy what magic is. So he puts together a day where the top magicians come. The top sorcerers. And when they came, the duel began. The Quran mentions, So when they came, he said, throw whatever you want to throw. He gave them the order. You know, like you play cricket or something, you know, you... Forget tossing up and saying heads we bat, tails you field or whatever. It's you know what, you can do what you want. What do you want to do? You want to bat first? You want to bowl first? So Musa is saying, Throw whatever you want to throw. And as they threw, the magic was such. It kind of did an illusion on the eyes of the people. It made it appear to the people that these ropes that they had thrown on the floor resemble snakes. Which shows you that there is magic, there is il illusion. There is this type of hallucination that can take place based on what people say and that can do uh, magic on your eyes. Things may appear to you as, wow, look at this. This man's body is being chopped in half. You know, like they do the Paul Daniels and the Houdinis and the David Blaines. So 
they do all their magic. And then Musa says to them, Majid tum bihi bi sihr. You, what, what you brought here is nothing but sihr. This isn't something special or ordinary. This is nothing divine from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is just sihr. Inna Allah sayyibtilu. Inna Allah la yuslihu amal al-mufsideen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will, will expose its worthlessness. And surely Allah is not with those who cause corruption. So what does he do? He throws down his stick. And those ropes that were going around and made it appear in the eyes of the people that they were like little snakes. This stick became a serpent and it swallowed the snakes. And you can imagine the shock of the people around. And also the shock of the who? The sorcerers, the magicians. They had never seen anything like this. And they knew that this was not any mere magic. They knew that this was a, a prophet sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quran mentions, وَأُلْكِيَ السَّحْرَةُ سَاجِدِينَ They fell down in prostration. And they began to say, قَالُوا آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Rabbi Musa wa Harun, that we believe now with full conviction that Musa and Harun are sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We were just standard magicians, tricksters, fraudsters, dabbling in magic. But this is a higher being and he has sent these prophets and we believe in him. And obviously this really made Fir'aun become really angry. And Fir'aun, what did he do? He said, look, if you don't renounce this, you're embarrassing me here. I will kill you. I will hang you. And then they said, yes, go do whatever you want because we now know we have seen the truth. And they made the dua, Rabbana afrig alayna sabran wa tawaffana muslimin. Oh Allah, pour down upon us patience and allow us to die as Muslims. We have now seen the situation. So this is the first encounter where we get the context that during the time of Musa salam and Fir'aun, magic sorcery was prevalent. That's why when Musa salam came to Fir'aun, he thought, oh, you're just a standard magician trying to impose your tricks on me. I will get the best magicians in town to sort you out. So that's the first one. Just a side point here as well. As we go, I'll give you some side points as well as we go through the talk. Do you notice, and this is a constant theme uh, in, 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 in the life of magicians and sorcerers and people who call towards this thing, that they are always dependent. They tell you that they can do anything and everything for you, yet they themselves are dependent for money, for wealth, for status, whatever. Yet they are sending these cards through your door saying, I can help increase your risk. I can help you get this position, whatever, yet they themselves have always been miskeen, poor. Have you ever realized this? They came to Fir'aun because Fir'aun said, if you can deal with him, I will give you money. They should have said, we don't need money. We already have money. We are the ones who do these spells and potions that give other people money and give other people power and status like they say when they put these little cards through your doors. But the reality is they, are, they always are on the receiving end of the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they are not in a position to give anyone anything. However, we are naturally people who don't have knowledge. We become gullible. We become naive. And then we go to the number and then we begin to call the number. And then we fall into this world of black magic with these people, these charlatans. So that's the first one. The second one we know about another prophet who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given this special dua, this power that he had not given to any other prophet after him. You see, every prophet had this special, you can call like an atom bomb dua, atomic dua, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would, would give them that unique dua. Musa alayhi salam, his dua was, Ya Allah, Fir'aun is such a tyrant. Please make sure he does not embrace Islam. He is just so wretched, so arrogant. So Allah accepted his dua that when the time came, when the, the waves came crashing in, when he was 
tried to chase after Musa alayhi salam. And then he tried to say the kalima and Jibreel alayhi salam was putting mud into his mouth to make sure he doesn't. Nuh alayhi salam who preached for 900 years and he bore that with patience. He made a dua, Ya Allah, make sure no one survives. Those who are not upon Tawheed. These people are, are arrogant in their disbelief. Our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his dua is saved for the day of judgment. Where he will intercede for everyone who says the kalima shahada. One day, every person from Jahannam will be cleansed of their sins and they will ta be taken to Jannah because of the intercession of our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet has been given that status. What about Sulaiman alayhi salam? He made a dua, Rabbi habli mulkan la yambaghi li ahadim min ba'di. Oh Allah, grant me a kingdom that you shall never grant to anyone after me. And this kingdom had to have something about it. And did Allah give him a, such a kingdom? Of course. He was given the ability to converse with animals, to listen to animals, to control the wind, to control the weather, and more importantly, relevant to today's topic, he had the ability to control the jinn. Obviously, they must have existed. That's why he had the ability to control them. And that's our iman that they do exist, just in case people don't think that they exist sitting here. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him the ability to control the jinn, and he would use the jinn to construct and do everything and anything and they used to hate working for him they used to hate working for him and he controlled the jinn and he would make sure that they do not dabble in bad elements black magic kabbalah kind of stuff that spells and magic things that really do exist and what he did he gathered all the books of black magic and ibn kathir brings this narration and he buried all of the books under his throne. No jinn could come near his throne. If they came near his throne, they would burn. Shaitan couldn't come near his throne. The shayateen could not come near his throne. And on one occasion, as he is sitting, watching them work, and he's resting on his stick, it is decreed that it is time now for him to die, and his soul is taken out, and he's in this position observing the jinn working. The jinn were so incapable of realizing that this person who is controlling us has now died that they carried on working, working, working until Allah sent a small insect that began to chew on the stick. And then within a few days or so, when the stick gave in, the weight of Suleiman made the stick fall and he fell over and they saw this lifeless corpse and they said, yes, freedom, freedom. The man who was controlling us, the man who Allah had given the unique ability to control the jinn, he is now no more and we are liberated and we are free. Then according to Ibn Kathir in his tafsir, it's mentioned that there's two narrations. One is that shaitan came in the form of a man and one said it was a jinn in the form of a man. And he came and he said, do you know how Suleiman alayhi salam controlled all the jinn? He said, how? said he used black magic he had books special sorcery books special books that he would read and then he would do his mantras and he would do all these things and this would cause him to have this ability and the power and the man or shaitan whoever it was he said look if you don't believe me i'll stay here go dig under his throne and if you find that there are no books there you can kill me i will stay i will not run away and they began to dig they went under the arsh and they began to dig, dig, and lo and behold, what did they find? They found the books. And from that day, Bani Israel or the Jews of that time, they would always think that Suleiman was what? A sahir. He was a sorcerer. That is why the Messenger وسلم, when he was in Medina, and he would converse with the Jews, he would say, what do you say about the Jews, uh, the uh, Suleiman Islam? What do you Jews say about Suleiman Islam, the Prophet Nabi? And they would say he was a sahir. He was a magician. It's permissible. We can't do black magic. We can't do Kabbalah. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَتْلُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ وَعَلَى مُلْكِ السُّلَيْمَانِ وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانُ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرُ Surah Baqarah, this is an ayah that, that came down which, which Allah is saying that it was Sulaiman al Islam, it wasn't Sulaiman who disbelieved, it was the shayateen who taught people. Harut and Marut were two angels that came down in Babylon and they taught people how to do black magic. However, they almost had a, 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 a disclaimer. They said to the people, and it says in the Quran, وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ حَتَّى يَقُولَ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرُ that they would teach people magic, but they would say, hang on a minute. This is going to be kufr, this is going to do this, and we are fit, fit enough for you, so it's up to you. If you want to dabble in it, it's going to take you towards the doors of kufr. It's dangerous. And they would also do this thing that is very common, or was common, or is, or is something that is regular when it comes to an act that pleases shaitan. And what is that? فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّكُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ They would teach from this magic a specific type of magic that would cause farq, division between مَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ between husband and wife. It exists. Nobody can deny this. It's in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this that the history of black magic came down when these two angels came down, Harut and Marut, and they would say to the people that we are a test. Make sure you don't come near this. But people are in their weakness. They want you to learn. And Allah mentions, That no harm can take place except with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a long ayah and then it carries on saying about how these people have sold their akhirah for a meager price. These people who deal in magic, the sorcerers, the magician. So here we have another example. First we had Musa alayhi salam, and now we have Suleiman alayhi salam talking or, or sh showing us that magic exists. Jinn exist. The division between husband and wife caused through magic is real. So these are two examples. Another example we can take from the hadith or from the seerah of the Messenger وسلم, is when he himself was afflicted by magic. Labid ibn al asam who was a Jew, the hadith is collected by Imam Bukhari, he was a Jew who lived in Medina and he wanted to do something to kill the Messenger وسلم, so he went into the books of black magic and he brought out the most strongest black magic. According to narrations, this black magic, had it been done to anyone else, psh, brain hemorrhage, you, you're dead. How did he do this magic? He asked somebody to get the hair of the Prophet ﷺ from his beard as the Prophet would comb his beard. He managed to get a few hairs of the Prophet and he, then he began to blow with the nuts. Another side point. The strongest form of magic if it is truly magic, is when it has something to do with your DNA. Your hair, your sweat, perspiration, clothing, anything that has any remnants or marks of your DNA, that is the most potent magic. Hence we see how the messenger's hair was taken and knots were tied. And how did it affect the messenger? Did it affect revelation? No. Allah protected the revelation. So whenever the revelation came down, that wasn't affected. The only thing that affected the Messenger وسلم, is that he would think that he did something, whereas in reality he didn't do that thing. So he would think, uh, did I do something that necessitates that I need to perform ghusl? And our mothers would say, Aisha uh, radiallahu anha would say, no, what, 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 what do you mean you need to do ghusl? Nothing's happened. Have I done this? Have I done this? Then he began to get worried. Ya Allah, something's not right. I'm feeling lethargic as well. It's not me. This is not me. I know myself. I know my body. I know my mental state. And this is not right. Something's wrong. And then the narration mentions he went to sleep. 
And in the sleep, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down two angels in the form of men or angels. And one stood by the Prophet's head and one stood by the feet of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they began to converse and speak to each other. The first one said, what is wrong with him? The one by the feet said, he has been afflicted, affected and afflicted by sihr, by magic. Who has done the magic? Asks the, the one by the head. Labid ibn al-A'asam. Labid has done the magic? Yes. How has he done the magic? With the hair. Where is the magic? It's in a certain well. And the, the well is made to appear so the Prophet can take in and he knows what well it is. Where is it in the well? There's a stone and underneath the stone there is the hair that is, is hidden under leaves. So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa he wakes up and he thanks Allah and then he begins to pray to Allah. Ya Allah, I need a cure now. I know what's happened. That I have been affected by magic. Now I need a cure. And not only did Allah send the Prophet a cure, He sent us a cure as well. Mu'adhatayn. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq and qul a'udhu bi rabbin nas. These two uh, surahs were sent down specifically for this particular incident. So the narration mentions the Prophet sent one Sahabi to the uh, well and he picked up the rock he went into the well as the prophet described to him he said this is the well you'll see it you go there he went down and as the messenger had foretold lo and behold he opened the he went down he op uh, took the rock under the rock there was a, a leaf underneath the leaf there was the knots and he began to read and read and read and as he read and as he read all the way through to the end the surahs the ayats the last one when he read it the messenger he got up as though a heavy burden was 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 weighing him down a sinister force was laying was really putting a lot of weight on him like a magnet like a 200 kg magnet that's on you and you're feeling tired and lethargic and the narrations mention that when the uh, the nuts were open and the blowing was finished the prophet got up as though he was back to normal subhanallah so another lesson we learn here is solution is from the quran the prophet never went to anyone to find out he didn't go to the jinn like some people in our community will say, we can go to the jinn, we can find out everything. No, he turned to Allah and Allah then sent down that solution that we should equip ourselves with. Should be part of our spiritual armory. Should be part of our spiritual weapons that we should do the adhkar to keep ourselves protected. And then the narration mentions, subhanAllah, look at the, the messenger, rahmatul lil alameen. Our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says that the Prophet told her that it was Labid ibn al-A'sum who did the magic. And she says that the messenger would continue to speak to Labid as though nothing happened. You know, look at the beauty of this. He would, how are you Labid? Are you okay? How's everything? Labid, obviously he's done the magic. He didn't tell the Prophet, I've done the magic. And he doesn't know the Prophet knows. And look at the way the Prophet, you need to have a big heart. You know, sometimes we say we're on the Sunnah and we find something small, somebody's upset us and we're there to fight with that person. Don't talk to me. You're off the manhaj. I don't want to know you anymore. And yet you have a kafir who's done sihr on the messenger and he would say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to our mother Aisha, what do I need to do, deal with Labid for? Allah has cured me. I'm fine. Leave him alone. He doesn't need to know that I've been cured. He still thinks that I'm always tired and whatever. Khalas. I don't need to take him to task. Allah has cured me. That is sufficient for me. So we begin to learn here that sihr exists. We have Musa alayhi salam, Suleiman alayhi salam, and one from our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, the incident that took place. So now we move over to today's day and age. People may be afflicted with black magic. People who have been to the doctors. They have no history of mental health. They have no mental health that has been passed down 
through the genes, genetics. Their mother didn't have mental health issues. Their father didn't have mental health issues. The grandparents, everything is fine from the, 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 the lineage, hereditary. There's nothing that has been uh, passed down through the genes. You've been to the doctor. Mental health is fine. Blood work, serotonin levels are fine. Everything is great. Then you now need a spiritual cure. Because the signs are maybe that you are affected by magic. A quick side point before I go any further. The advent of COVID spiked the amount of mental health issues in our community. And not even in our community, in uh, the UK and the world. Imagine not knowing what this thing was when it came out. Imagine being boxed off in your house for six months, five months, four months, whatever it was. Imagine having limited exposure or contact with people once the lockdown was lifted. It sent a lot of people, it, it changed their mental outlook in life, made them really ups, uh, ill mentally. So we've seen this as an increase. So we cannot conflate the issue, that's why I keep coming back. So it doesn't exasperate a person's mental health condition because when a person has mental health illness, it's like any other illness that Allah is testing them with. Somebody may have diabetes, Allah is testing them with diabetes. Somebody may have blood pressure, Allah is testing them with blood pressure. Somebody may have issues with kidneys, they have to go for dialysis, Allah is testing them through this. Somebody may have genuine mental health issues, Allah is testing them through this. And it makes the situation worse if you get these things, oh, I'm getting thoughts, I think it's jinn, sihr, ain, I want to kill myself. Psychosis, schizophrenia, it's a mental health condition that needs health and so help and support. Alongside reading Quran, yes, nobody's taking away the fact that Quran will also help you and assist you spiritually. But alongside this, you cannot tell a person who has broken his arm just to read Quran. You know, you won't say this, you'll say go to the doctor, he'll put the plaster on. He'll put the, uh, the bone closest together as possible. He'll put a cast on. And then you can obviously read Quran. It will may speed up the process. Shifa ultimately comes from Allah. Of course. But you don't say, hey, don't go to the hospital. Just sit at home. And just read Quran. Read Surah Fatiha. You have, you have to have Iman. No, no, no. We have to get the balance right. So, coming back to the point. If you've been to the doctor and you get these signs, these are some of the signs of people who have been affected by black magic. One of the signs is if you get regular, persistent, consistent dreams where you are being chased by a black dog, you're being chased by snakes, you are falling from a height regularly. We're not talking about one-off. Taking you getting every one day, every other day, and this is happening for weeks and months. It's no coincidence. You're not having a random nightmare that we all have yes this is regular then this could be a sign that you are afflicted by magic another sign is when you are normally jolly with everyone and anyone at work you're amazing you have your own personality that Allah has blessed you with you're always happy with work colleagues you're happy with your friends you're happy with everyone, but as soon as you walk into the house, you see your partner, you can't stand your partner. And your partner hasn't done anything. There's something, you just can't stand them. You just want to run away from them. This could be a sign of magic between husband and wife. You don't want to have intimate relations with your wife. You don't want to cohabit with them anymore. For many, many weeks, months, sometimes years pass. For no reason. Maybe this is magic again. Others could be, you start seeing things as well. And again, you've checked yourself out mentally, psychologically, there are no issues. Doctors giving you the okay. But then you start seeing things that no one else can see. Perhaps another sign. So these are signs that a person has been afflicted by black magic. Another one is the uh, uh, Adhan is going on. 
and you just can't stand it. You just, you just, you want to run away. You are standing here. If you can manage to make your way to the masjid, if you are, you know, if you have uh, issues with uh, with magic and whatever, if you open, you know, and you have. You hear the sound of the Quran, you hear the sound of the Adhan, you just want to run away. You just don't like even yourself reading the Quran. You don't want to open the Mus'haf. You don't like to hear the Qirat of anyone. You just want to run away. This is another sign. And you have no issues with anything else. You listen to music, no problem. Makes you feel better actually. You um, listen to uh, anything else, watch TV, whatever, no problem. Soon as the Quran... Is recited, you just want to get out of there. You just don't feel right. Your heart starts pounding more. Again, if you haven't got anxiety, depression, whatever, then it's worth finding out that this is a strong indicator that you have sihr or jinn issues. So these are some of the signs of people who may be possessed. And again, the, the solutions are there. The solutions are there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the cure. Muadzatayn, surah falak al nas. But even take a step back before we even go to just reciting the Quran, uh, the, these surahs. Do we have a connection with Allah? To, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we don't have this connection, then ultimately what's going to happen is that we have our defense system is down. And whatever comes to us in the form of satanic issues, because shaitan did promise that he will mislead us, he will do whatever he can. He also has an army of, of shayateen. And if we don't have a connection with Allah, then how do we expect to be protected? You know, it's like one Amil said, uh, one uh, Iraqi he mentioned in his talk. He said, it's like um, you're in the park and you're walking in the park and a, a Guy comes with a big Rottweiler and he's, he has him on a, on a leash. And the Rottweiler is very close to you and you, you're scared. He's going for you. What do you start doing? Do you start saying to the Rottweiler, please don't hurt me? Or do you say to the owner, can you please take your dog? He's going to have the leash. Say, Sorry, mate. He'll pull the leash back and restrain the dog and the dog will move on. And the owner will move on. Same way, if you have issue with sihr, jinn, you ask Allah, the creator, the khaliq, of all the makhluk, you ask Allah, Allah, you are the one who created everything. This jinn, this thing, you can, I'm asking you Allah. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ مُدْعُونِ أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Your Lord is saying, ask me and I shall answer your du'as. So the first thing is, we must be praying. And this is one of the issues that we have in our communities. We are not praying and we want to look for shortcut. And who is more Pleasing for us when we are desperate and we are <coughs> gullible and naive. Peer Saab, Molana Saab, whoever Saab, Wasim Saab. I don't want to be seen as attacking anyone. Just say me, Wasim Saab. He looks the part, doesn't he? Everything, yeah, he looks, you know, the part. He, he has these cards that he gives out. If you have any issues, I will go to him. First thing is, I will do things that I will take money off you. I will say, wear this. I will say, wear that. I will even say, if I'm working with jinn, that I can control jinn. And the gullible people will think, oh, mashallah, he's the wali of Allah if he can control jinn. But then I again want to take you back to the time of Suleiman Islam. In fact, we have a hadith collected by Imam Muslim when the Prophet is praying in Masjid Nabawi and whilst he's praying, he's seen doing a certain gesture like with his hand during the prayer. The sahaba are like watching what's going on here. And when the prayer concludes, it's not he's throttling someone or something, but it's invisible. And when the Prophet concludes, Taslim, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, they said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, was this like some kind of a new way of praying? What was this? We didn't. And the Messenger said, Today, Shaitan became so desperate to finish me that he sent one of his big jinns, Ifrit. He had a ball of fire in his hand and he came to me and I grabbed him from his neck. And his tongue was on the back of my hand. Had it not been for the dua of my brother Suleiman salam, I would have tied him to the satoon, to the pillar, and I would have made the young children of Medina throw slippers at him and play with this jinn. But I had to let him go. I have no ability to control the jinn. 
This is the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So when a person says that I can control the jinn, I can liaise with the jinn, we're going into the sinister world of what magicians. It's a sign of a magician. How? What do they do? Our teachers used to tell us this. When a person does this thing called a chilla, meaning that you go and you seclude yourself in a remote area for 40 days, 30 days, 20 days. You are doing an act that is pleasing the jinn. And they see this. You've gone to a, a jungle, you've taken fruit and you, you make a circle and you sit in the circle. And they're saying, this Bani Adam, the best of creation is asking us, we are, they are superior, we're inferior. And it makes them feel good. So they'll come out and, you know, the relationship is made then. Can you help me? Can you do this and whatever? We'll have this relationship. So what does the jinn say? Yes, I will be of assistance. Remember, you can't control me, but I can to a certain degree be part of your communication process when people come to you. I can speak to their qareen. Do you know what a qareen is? It is a jinn that each and every one of you has with you. Our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, every son of Adam has one. Our mother said, even you are messenger of Allah. And the hadith mentions there were two answers. There were two different uh, narrations. One, the messenger said, yes, me too. And this qareen doesn't command me towards evil things. It doesn't do that. It commands me towards good. And the second narration, it said, my qareen has submitted to Islam. So this devil or this qareen that is with you, that's the one that's always saying, go on, do this, do that. No one's looking, etc. He's always with you until you die. So when you go to this person, when you go, the qareen, the jinn will talk to your qareen. Your defenses are down. You're not praying. You don't do your adhkar. You're leaving your doors open. He will extract information and he will tell the person and he'll say, yeah, tell me, fulan, fulan, how are your three children doing? You say, oh, how did you know I got three children? Because the jinn asked the qareen and within two minutes he gave all the information. He's with you all the time. That's one way. That's one way. And there's many other ways. Another way is if you go to these people and they don't ask you to read Quran or they don't, they don't read Quran over you, but they say, don't even bother bringing the person. Just bring me some of their DNA. Meaning, bring me, if it's a woman, they'll say, bring me her dupatta. Bring me her clothing. You're thinking, and again, we are gullible. Eh? We don't say, what? Say, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, let's get a okay. We don't bring one, we bring the whole bag. Bag full, hey, it's up, take it. Whatever you want. Huh? Again, he's using magic to counter magic. Another common thing, they will ask for your mother's name. Bring me a dupatta, bring me some clothing. And also, what is the mother's name of the person? Again, our teachers used to tell us this. In the world of the jinn, you are referred to through your mother's name in the world of insan. You are known through your kunia, through your father's name, Abu Bakr, Abu Ahmed, Abu Hudayfa. But in the world of the jinn, it's the other way around. You are referred to through your mother's name. So again, that's how they are getting this information. And then they will give you certain things not in accordance with the Quran and Sunnah, which will strengthen the world of the jinn or the, the magic, etc. For example, I've heard many cases where if a person is being affected by jinn, the amil is going to say, yeah, okay, take some meat, throw it in, the, in a certain graveyard, do it for three or four days, and then, uh, trust me, you, you'll be fine. And that's what the person does, goes, throws the meat, the jinns leave them alone for a few months, and then the person is 100% certain this action really works. This man is a spiritual saint. I went to this person. I didn't have the patience to continue reading the Quran. I read it for a few days. I wasn't feeling that well, that good. I went to this person. He said, just throw meat on the cemetery or meat on the roof. Get a black rooster. Throw, put it in a bag. Throw it, cut his head off. Throw it in the water, in a running water. All these things. And people say, you know what? I feel better. Why? Because the jinn leaves you alone because he wants you to rely on the magic and the sorcery, not on the tawakkal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how they work. They know mankind is weak. 
That mankind was made weak. He doesn't have the patience. So when we go for the shortcuts, they say, yeah, come on in. A woman came to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa said, my son has got, uh, he's possessed. What did the prophet say? Okay, bring me his trousers, bring me his kurta, bring me his this. He said, bring him to me. Him. The narration mentions he came, the messenger put him on the back of his uh, knee and he began to recite over him. Then he turned him over and he, he spat in his mouth. And then he said, Ukhrujudu Allah. Get out, O enemy of Allah. Get out. Then he smacked him on his back again. He said, go. A week or so later, he found the woman walking again in the market somewhere. He says, tell me, how's your son? She goes, Allah, he's, he's perfect. Meaning that is the way you read over the person. You don't say, tell me the mother's name. Bring me some item of clothing. These are signs of a magician. So I'm telling you some of the, the, the solutions here as you go. I hope you're making notes of this. That if you feel that you, are, you have to be praying, you have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Him more than you've ever asked Him. Get up in the middle of the night when Allah descends from the... From, from his throne in a manner befitting his majesty and he asks is there anyone who is up in the night who can I can uh, uh, give their dua uh, the answer their dua what is it that you need but we're too busy snoring we're too busy waiting for the 10 o'clock in the morning appointment with the uh, magician because that's easier but we don't want to get up in the morning at 6 or 5 o'clock in the morning easier in the winter Qiyamul Layl, Tahajjud time and to, to pray to Allah. So you have to be connected and then you have to have a strong connection with the Athkar and the Qur'an. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said after uh, Fajr and Maghrib, Thalatha Marat, three times, Bismillah alladhi la yadurru ma asmihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fi samai wa huwa alim. In the name of Allah, nothing can touch you, nothing harms you without the permission of Allah. Nothing in the heavens and the skies and Allah has all knowledge. Say that, nothing will touch you from Fajr until Maghrib. You say it again after Maghrib, you blow off yourself, nothing will touch you from Maghrib till Fajr. On top of this, you strengthen your spiritual armory, Muzatain. Some of the ulama mentioned not just Falak and Nas, you read Surah Ikhlas as well. Some say you read the Fokuls. Nothing wrong with that. You read, you blow, you stay protected. Ayatul Kursi. You will know this. Read this. And you keep yourself protected. This is proper tawakkul. Not giving up at the first hurdle. You know what? I did it for a few weeks and you know what? It's not working. You expecting it to be like this. Have you heard, not heard the story of Ayyub alayhi salam? A prophet of Allah who is absolutely finished after enduring years of being leprosy and finished until he cried from the depths of his heart then Allah cured him. When he exhausted every ounce and iota of patience and Allah knows everything. And then when Allah knew that he couldn't go on anymore, then Allah's help came. And we just read the Quran a few times and we say, oh, what's not working? You know what? Carry on, carry on, carry on. So you have to do these adhkar and also Quran, you have to pray. Uh, you, can, you can do self ruqya as I say, any part of the Quran is shifa. You can do, read Surah Fatiha, keep blowing on yourself, read before you go to sleep, make sure you read before you go to sleep as well, blow all over your body. Try and stay in wudu all the time. If you break your wudu, do wudu again, refresh it. Again, it's a good habit. Maybe Allah is testing you through this small musibah to give you a habit for life. Yeah? That six months you keep doing this, or a year you keep doing wudu, wudu, your magic lessens, weakens, weakens, weakens. After a year, you are free from magic. And yet, as a bonus, as a bonus, you have this habit for life. For the next 40, 50 years that you are in this dunya, you are always like, it's as though you've lost something if you don't do wudu, if you break your wudu. It's as though you've lost something so valuable if you don't do your adhkar after the salah, the mandatory prayers. So maybe Allah is testing you to give you something and then he will uh, give you that spiritual uplift through this. Another way of looking at it is that if you are not cured on the day of judgment, this will be an expiation for your sins. 
The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, even the pricking of a thorn is an expiation of your sins. On the Day of Judgment, you will see this. That Allah said, okay, I, I tested you in the dunya, now in the akhirah, you have an upgrade. You could have been on the first floor of this hotel, for example, basic. But now because of what you went through, you are up in the penta the top, top, you know, the top floor. Because of what you patiently endured. Again, win-win situation. You always have to think positive. Other things is, try not to go to places where jinns become strong or do these actions. Music is a big one. Music, the jinns thrive on music. If you're watching music and listening to music and watching MTV or whatever else it is, then you are strengthening the magic, you are strengthening the jinn. If you're watching pornography, if you are into immorality, indecency, it is strengthening the sinister forces inside you. And you'll find it difficult and difficult to break free from the shackles. So this is something else, you know, when we used to do rookie on people many years ago, me and brother Askar from Greenland Masjid, we used to go, we used to offer like a free service to the people. A lot of people were calling in saying, uh, you know, this Raki, this Raki. We said, look, we're not going to charge you anything. We'll go. And we came across some crazy, crazy, uh, uh, not all of them. Some of them were mental health issues that we had to tell, you know, go and see the doctors. Some were like really next level devil worship jinn gin inside them, you know. And uh, within a few seconds, if you read somebody, you know, they, they would do these kind of things. You know, this was a sign, make hissing noises. So we'd always smack the hand to, 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 to make sure they don't make this sign. This is like a devil sign. We felt that they were getting more power. They were more resilient. Get this, and they're making all these signs. The, the sounds would change. So it'd be a woman and her voice would become like a man, very husky, very coarse like this. Right? It, it, there'd be like a 70 kg person, 9, 10 stone. They'd, it takes six, seven people to restrain them. They would just flip all of a sudden. So the point I'm making is when we recite the Quran, yes, the jinn will manifest or the voice or whatever. And sometimes we'll speak. We don't, we don't entertain it too much because the jinns will lie. They're not going to tell you the truth. They'll lie. Oh, my, his brother sent it. His father sent it. They want to cause fitna. We just carry on reading, reading, and it's burning, I'm burning, I'm burning. But the jinn will never leave. The jinn will never leave because the jinn will take the punishment. It's like it braces itself and it can recover quicker than a human. Because we haven't got all day. We're not going to be there for seven days and 365 days a year. You know, we'll just read for a few hours, we're gone. Then the jinn is strong after we've gone because the person who is living inside... They will watch pornography, they will listen to music, they will not pray, they will eat with their left hand. All these things makes the jinn strong. Okay, no worries. They'll be back next week. I'll brace myself for the next Rukia session, get a bit of pounding. They'll go, I'll get back to normal. I love staying in this person's house. The Bollywood films, the Hollywood films, dramas, they love this. But you start putting the Quran on, you start reading Surah Baqarah every day. Shaitan doesn't come for three days. Anything, it runs. It's, you start smelling for it. The sinister forces hate it. That's another important thing you need to do. Make your house a place that has this odor for the jinn. It's like, oof, I can't stay here. Normally, wallahi, our weddings, from DJs to dancing... And then we talk about like, uh, you know, wh why did we break up? It's been six months, they got married and, they, and we spent £60,000 on the venue. £5,000 on the DJ. Molana Saab comes to probably do the most important part of the wedding. And they give him £50, put in his pocket, yeah, it's £50 for you. And you go, oh yeah, subhanAllah. And they give £10,000, £5,000 to the DJ, lights, music, everything. And then what happens? Khalas, no barakah, no blessing. It started off with shaitan. Shaitan, like some scholars say, music is the Quran of shaitan. Music is the Quran, it's the lyrics. The shayateen love it. 
So you have to take your life away from, this, from the obedience of shaitan, the music, the haram, your friends, drinking, the vices which are prevalent in society. S wipe the slate clean. Come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do self ruqya. Don't go to the soothsayers. If our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was affected and he turned to Allah, he didn't turn to any jinn. He didn't say, ask, you know, find out who did this. That's where the cure lies. We are going to conclude now. I hope I've covered it uh, in, in the last hour or so since we started this talk. Um, any questions? Please feel free to ask me any questions related to the talk. Inshallah, I'll try my best with Allah Ta'ala to answer the question. Um, so, yes, we will conclude with me uh, giving you again a summary, quick summary. Uh, jin, uh, sihr does exist. Musa alayhi salam, Suleiman alayhi salam, at the time of our Prophet, yes, these things do is, exist. Alongside these things, the solutions also exist as well that were given to our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, found in the Quran and also ways of avoiding the people. Do self ruqya do your own spiritual uh, treatment, but stay away from the charlatans in our communities who exploit people, who manipulate people. And that's the best way, uh, inshallah, that we will be free from these uh, things. Uh, and also, most importantly, like I began by saying, Mental health is also on the increase. Do not please conflate. Do not conflate this issue. Everything is oh, nazar lagiya, ain, somebody's done jadu. You know, and the poor person who really is struggling, they have a low level of serotonin and they need to see a psychiatrist, they need to have some antidepressants to increase the level. You're just killing them off more. Killing them off more. Get them to see a professional, a medical practitioner, a doctor. Any questions? Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah <laughs> khayyam for this beautiful talk. Just by way of introduction, my name is Maruf. I'm a consultant psychiatrist. Mashallah, mashallah. I've been doing this for 40 years. Mashallah, you should be sitting next to me. <laughs> we should have done it together, this talk. Well, actually, I've retired. I'll be retiring fully in the next few months. But why I've been chasing this talk is because in my clinic, and I have my favorite patients, they are the people of my faith, patients. Most of them will come with this idea of, it's got nothing to do with your medicine, it's the gene. Now my question is this, when you're going to do root care, and all these signs come out, uh, they speak like a man and so on. Are you able to get the gene out with the prayers? Is there something that mm. will signify that the prayers has they've cracked the genes mm -hmm. and they are ready to leave? The, yeah. So Zakla Her, your name was Doctor. Maruf, mashallah, a brother who's uh, Allah Mabarik, uh, a doctor, psychiatrist who has sat through the talk and obviously he concurs with what I mentioned about the importance of mental health. These things do exist and some of the people who do come to him, they complain about jinn. When in reality, some of those cases, perhaps majority of those cases are not jinn, they are to do with mental health. A lot of our cases, again, like I mentioned, they were not exactly jinn. Okay, mental health, but some jinn ones have existed. Okay, some people are in a heightened state of paranoia. They would think or they would want to believe it's jinn. But majority of them weren't. That's why we would always signpost them first to go and see a person like yourself. But there were other cases that there were people, uh, there were jinn. For example, we had one case by another Raqi. This wasn't witnessed by ourselves. Where a jinn would manifest itself, difficult to take out. And then the reading and the ruqya would become severe on the jinn. And the jinn is saying, look, I want to leave, I want to leave. The raqi would say, okay, show us a sign that you're going to leave. Show us a sign. Because you're known to lie. You, you keep saying, I'm going to leave, but you stay inside the body. So there'll be a glass of water we put by the window. Show us, knock that glass of water on the way out. Show us that you are going to leave. And there have been incidents where the water has knocked down, the person's got better. Not all the time. But these things do exist. We have seen them as well. Okay? 
So I hope that answers your question. Majority of them, we always try and signpost them towards the medical practitioners, the psychological issues. But there are some cases where it is jinn and sihr and things like this. Subhanallah, there's a lot of questions. Are we staying till Fajr or something? I've traveled like two hours ago. I'm a bit tired. <laughs> yeah. Are these from the jinn? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first good question. Why do people do black magic? Well, like, this is a good question. Yeah, why do people do black magic? And wallahi, in today's day and age, I mentioned this in the social media talk that I did as well. Hasid, the spiritual illnesses are in the increase. Envy, anger, jealousy, anything to destroy the life of somebody else. Anything. I just cannot bear the fact that this couple here are living like this. I want to do anything by any means necessary where I am not implicated. Nobody knows that I've done it. And the best way people feel is by doing black magic. They're not going to do anything worldly. They're not going to say, okay, can you go and hire a hitman? Kill somebody. Astaghfirullah. Although some people do this, their height of jealousy gets to that. But then you're going to get some consequences. You know, that's murder. Police will track you down. So they're looking for other spiritual ways from the world of the unseen and the ghaib. And like I mentioned, in the Quran, Allah has mentioned this. Surah Baqarah, Harut Marut came down as a trial. Magic exists. It came into the world. Certain books exist that do this kind of stuff and create the, fric uh, the, the division between husband and wife. Allah mentions this in the Quran and some people will seek out these people and say, please, I, I don't mind if it affects my religion. I don't mind if I maybe will leave the fall of Islam, but I want to see these couple break. I want to see this person lose his business. I want to see this person do X, you know, X Y and Z. So our thing is, do your athkar, Stay protected, pray to Allah, but in, most importantly, in today's social media era, don't showcase everything and anything. Just be normal, be balanced, stay grounded. Yeah, we are our worst enemy. We want to showcase to everyone, okay, and then we are the, the ain, again, evil eye. The Prophet said, the evil eye exists. You cannot deny the evil eye. But somebody will have this thing that Allah has given them. And it will, you know, somebody could just, with so much inner hatred, people could die. These things exist. We are made up of mind, body, and soul. Three things. Psychology, spirituality, and the body. Three things in Islam. Yeah? So that's okay. When a person does black magic, what does he benefit of harming people? I think that's the same. So when a person does black magic, what does he benefit of harming people? Again, he thinks he will benefit. That person is ultimately a loser. But what they want to try and achieve is to try and maximize the harm for the intended target. How do we cure ourselves from the evil eye if we don't know who gave it? Again, evil eye, muadhatain, qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. Is there, you can read that, you can read Surah Ikhlas, you can read Surah Fatiha. The thing is consistency and persistency. We are always looking for the quick fix. You know, read uh, Surah A'raf, uh, verse number, you know, uh, 36, seven times in the morning, 20 times in the middle of the day and whatever. You just, just read with the yaqeen and the certainty from your heart. Every letter, every word, you are asking Allah, Allah, you are the one who will give shifa. You are the one who, does, who, who will cure me. And if it is a spiritual illness, if it is, inshallah, you will be on your way to recovery. If you are possessed, do you have black magic or has somebody done it to you? If you are possessed, do you have black magic? Uh, or has somebody done it? If you are possessed, do you have black magic or has somebody done it to you? I, I don't know what this actually means. If you are possessed, do you have black magic or somebody done it to you? Nobody does black magic on themselves. So somebody must have done black magic. Yeah? So if you have the signs and if it is black magic, obviously somebody has done black magic on you. Nobody can do black magic on themselves. You know, today I want to do a bit of hocus pocus on myself. You know, I think somebody, if it is a case of black magic. If someone keeps get, getting ill and has very unnatural type of illnesses, is it a sign they are addicted to black magic? See, this is what I mentioned at the beginning. If a person keeps getting ill, and has a very unnatural fear or the worst type of illness 
Sis, or is that a sign that they are again medical, mental health, anxiety, and depression is on the rise? This doesn't necessarily mean that it's black magic or sihr or jinn. These things are on the rise, and perhaps one of the reasons they're on the rise, or may, a few of the reasons, one is social media. Not getting too much screen time, not getting out there, allowing your endorphins to be. Uh, regulated in your body and feeling good because you're boxed off in your rooms, in your houses, watching things which are stimulating those negative emotions inside you. The jealousy, the hatred, uh, or you're feeling insecure about yourself. You're looking at somebody's house and wife and family and kids and job and you're measuring that with yourself and saying, I've got nothing. And you're feeling more depressed and you're feeling more anxious. So exercise, endorphins, Watch what you eat. We are living in the worst times now when it comes to fast food industry. Trans fatty acids, processed foods, pizzas, burgers. You know, we have doctors sitting here. They'll tell you these are not good for your body. There's a saying, we are what we eat. And wallahi, this is true. Your, you, what we eat has an effect on your mental state of mind. If you're not getting the right vitamins, you're eating the, the, you'll feel lethargic, you'll feel groggy, you'll feel tired. So it's all about going to the doctors, having a clean diet, praying, exercising, uh, going for walks, get the natural uh, thing. Even going for walks, it's been proven, even if you were to look at a picture of greenery and waterfalls, some people who had depression, just by looking at those kind of... It, it gives them a paradigm shift. They start feeling better, more relaxed. Yeah? Imagine if you go to these areas, you go to the hills, the mountains, you go for a walk... Therapeutic. Let's start doing this, inshallah, and that, that'd be good. So now, how would you respond to an Amil who uses numbers? Oh, this is a good question. Okay, so how would you respond to a, a person, Amil? Amil is a person who does, who has ways of curing you. They call these people Amil in the Indian subcontinent, who uses numbers, symbols, and grids, and says we are fighting fire with fire as a justification for the cure. Okay, there are people who do this, by the way. So we come across Tawi's amulets. And we say to the person, okay, uh, do you mind if we open up this amulet and we cut it open and, and show you what's inside? And the person will always swear, yes, yes, it's nothing but good because the person who gave it to me, he didn't show me what was inside. He just did it, made it and said, put it around you. This will keep you protected. Okay, so when we open it, we find hocus pocus numbers. We, we see... Uh, calling uh, nida upon the malaika, calling upon the angels, Ya Jibra'il, Ya Mikail, Ya Israfil on the corners, calling upon the angels. Sometimes it's not even the angels, it's some weird names that we've never come across, which means it's the jinn or whatever they're calling upon. Yeah? So we say stay away from this thing because this is using magic to fight magic. Just like the, the point I mentioned, the people who, 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 who stay jilla, they do. Okay, this is what we think. There's, there's nothing that shows Surah Fatiha written here or whatever, even though some of the scholars have said, even stay away from things like this. There is an ikhtilaf on this, but this is better to not rely on this. If you were sick, the doctor gave you a prescription to go and get some medicine. Would you put that prescription around your neck? Or would you go to the pharmacy, give the prescription, he will give you the tablets, and then you start taking tablets? You tell me. That's what they say, don't wear these things around you. That's like wearing a prescription around your neck. The shifa will come when you take the prescription, you give it to the pharmacist, he will give you the medicine, you take the medicine, whatever the course is. I think that's the last question. Brother, did you have a question? And then we're yeah, finished. The point, cause just relevant to the point that you just answered there about the, um, the numbers and the squares, the, the numbers and the squares are a direct copy, plagiarized literally, from the Kabbalah. Ah, there you go. Now, the, in the Kabbalah, the numerology is called Gematria. Mm. Okay? And the exact, uh, it's a conversion of letters to numbers. And what they do is simply, letter for letter, they plagiarize the Arabic le letters to numerals because Hebrew and Arabic are Semitic languages, so that's equivalent letters. Yes. And it's the same uh, numbers that they've been translated, the same square. <coughs> the squares, the Arabic will say, oh, What's this square? Oh, it's we've turned uh, I can call it into numbers because yes. I take it to the, the lie basically. 
But if you if, if you were to ever look at, I don't recommend learning that stuff, but even a cursory look at Kabbalah, um, these squares are normally, numerical squares are normally representations of different planets and spirits. Um, yeah. But they use the same ones and they convert it to Arabic. It's a good point. It's a good point because I have come across these and you'd be surprised, horizontal and vertical, they all equate. So you'll have a 7 and a 3 and a 2 and then that's 7, 3 and a 2, that's 12. And then going across, there'll be a, a 9 and a 1. So 12 this way, 12 this way. You know, and obviously Kabbalah, these things, mystical things, they exist because what did Suleiman al Islam hide? What was, it, what was it that was hiding under the throne? Yeah, these things exist and they may have made their way through. Just a quick point I want to mention. 786, very common. 786 is very common because people say, ah, it's Bismillah Rahman Rahim. 786. But what we say, like one of the, the, the scholars mentioned, is that this is something that's used by the, 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 the wrong type of people to negate the power of the meaning of Bismillah Rahman Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. This uh, uh, the statement that is even written on the arch of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being negated to 786, which means what? You're losing your identity. Dr. Maruf sitting in front of us. He's known in the community as Dr. Maruf. You have any mental health issues? Dr. Maruf is known. To be a person who will sort out your mental health issues. However, if we want to minimize the impact and the beneficial impact that Dr. Maruf has on his community, and we want to lessen the people going to Dr. Maruf, we'll say, go to 532. Who's 532? Dr. Maruf has lost his identity. The power of doctor is nothing because he's anonymous. Nobody will know him. That's exactly the power or what they try and do is to take away Bismillah rahman So you don't, it's 786. You lose your identity. Our Imam sitting here, you all know him, but then we just give him a number 311, <laughs> 655. Yeah, we all have names, identities, and we have this, and this is exactly what they say. 786 takes away in the name of Allah, the, the most beneficial, the most merciful. We would never say 786 before we eat. <laughs> yeah, you don't say 786 before you eat or whatever else you want to do. Um, that is another question. Yeah, the person is saying, if a person is afflicted by and pass away, what happens to the jinn? Yeah, uh, if, if a person is afflicted by a jinn and the person passes away, the jinn will move on. The jinn have a different uh, uh, lifespan. Jinns are known to have lived longer. And they do live longer. And they have different strengths. Okay? And, and um, we remember doing rookie on one person, a very strong type of, a, about six, seven of us. And Allahu A'lam again, jinns lie or whatever. But this was a haughty kind of, the person became ha 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 old kind of, you know, for a long time, six, seven hours. When you read, scream, stop, stop. Then all of a sudden he, he you know, then he said, look, I've seen guys like you come and go, Rakis. I am a 600 year old jinn from India. I am a chief of a particular tribe from a particular part of India. I've, I've, I've been sent to deal with this person. I'm going to stay in this person's body. I've seen guys like you come and go. And you wouldn't be surprised. These jinns, they do live longer. They have a different kind of a dimension to them. So don't think. And they have their own food. And they eat bones. And they eat they, and things like this. So they're not like us. 50, 60 year lifespan, 70 year lifespan, or 80, whatever. Some of them live for two, 300 years. Okay. And uh, any last question, brother? And then we'll finish, inshallah. Just on the last point you mentioned there about Dawi, obviously. Uh, but some people genuinely quote, like, or some ayat or something like that. Are those permissible? Yeah, okay. So the, the default position is to stay away from this because there are some scholars who allow this. They say, okay, Dawi is with the Quranic ayat, fine. But the stronger opinion is it's better not to. It's better not to. It's about reading. It's the same principle that we mentioned about the prescription. Isn't it better to read 
and to go to the pharmacy and to take that medication and to read on yourself, read the falak and nas instead of having it printed on your uh, on your uh, on your chest and having it there. So this is the, the key principle. Jazakumullah khairan. Have a safe trip home, guys. I hope I haven't scared any any of you and there's no Halloween or Ghostbusters or anything like this uh, going in, in your mind. the The key point is, as a Muslim, as a believer in Allah, you have to understand that we are the the, the best in creation. We are better than the jinn. That's why Allah said to shaitan to prostrate to Adam. This is from Allah. That this product here, the human being, is the best in creation. Better than the angels. Better than the jinn. Better than the animals who have no intellect. So we have to try and get that balance right. Don't get into this state of uh, scared and you get paranoid and stuff like that because the human being is the best in creation. And if we have that iman and we follow it through with our actions. We have, you know, five times a day we pray, we do the athkar. Wallahi, you know, inshallah, nothing should harm you. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum wa lisa'ilil muslimin fa astaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah. Jazakallahu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.